Good morning. Um, you know, I feel like I should not be following this guy. I mean, he was such a delightful speaker and, uh, you know, obviously with deep roots in this community. And I come uh, before you as uh, someone who has not been part of this community, although I have watched you for over two decades from policy points of view, reports to the uh, National Research Council and such. And so IB is always a topic uh, when we talk about high quality education for young Americans as we face these challenging times. However, uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm glad to hear that names were taken. Uh, I'm, I'm asking those to be turned over to me so I can add to that bonus. That was, uh, I'm not sure what my addition will be, but we'll try to make it something. Um, so I was asked to speak to you about ways of knowing from the perspective of a scientist. So the title of this conference, Ways of Knowing, Modus de la Connaissance, Formas de Conocimiento. All different languages saying the same thing, ways of knowing. And as a scientist, I'm very aware of the fact that we know the universe in a very peculiar way. Uh, science, uh, although in principle has been around for several thousand years and can trace its multiple roots back to a number of cultures, in the Western practice of science, we normally trace science back to the ancient Greeks. However, true modern science didn't really get born until the time of Galileo. And in fact, uh, Einstein um, credits Galileo with being the father first of physics and then the father of all of science because Galileo made an important observation that did not have a clear enunciation until that point. Um, there's this thing called the scientific method, which a number of people think of as a series of rules that we teach our students in science class. But in fact, the scientific method is really a statement about what it takes to do science. And by the way, uh, if you've sat through a science class and memorized words like endometrium philium or uh, penundrum or all the Greek terms, if you think that's science, you're wrong. Science is not the facts we relate to the students in the class. Science is a living, ongoing human endeavor. It's the process by which we uncover those facts. That defines science, not the facts themselves. I often tell the story that if you walked into a, the uh, studio of a sculptor and you looked down at the floor and saw all the pebbles and walked out and someone said, well, gee, what does a sculptor do? If your answer was someone who makes pebbles, then you've missed the entire point of the exercise. It's a piece of artwork that the sculptor is creating. That's why they sculptor, not to create little pebbles. And yet often in school, and certainly it's unfortunate for most young people exposed to science in American schools, all they get to do is have the pebbles thrown at them. And then of course they have to give them back in the form of tests. That's not science. Science, as I said, is the process by which we uncover our most precise understanding of how the universe works. And the addition that Galileo made to this process is that no matter who tells you something about science, you always have the right to dispute that and have a direct personal verification. It's about accuracy. So there are many confusions in our society about science. And one of the, one of the parables that I, I try to use to tell people what science is, is imagine I could perform a miracle. And if I told her, most people that, they would say, well, she, you know, there's something wrong with that guy. He's been watching too many uh, factors of uh, two on his paper. But suppose I had a close friend who believed me, and we went to my office, and I said, I'm going to perform a miracle at a given time. My friend showed up. I performed the miracle. My friend would be amazed. But if my friend's a scientist, guess what the next thing that this friend is going to say? Do it again. Not prove it. Do it again. Because you see, doing it again would again give my friend the chance to observe, and then maybe he would be excited, he or she, and go out the next day and say, you know, Jim could perform miracles in his office. And he might convince a few more of my colleagues at the University of Maryland Physics Department to come to my office to actually see me. And I say, okay, I'll perform a miracle, then boom, perform the miracle. As I get more and more scientists to come and watch the miracle being performed, they're gonna bring scientific instruments to observe me perform the miracle. And they're gonna record fluxes of electrons and heat and densities and pressures, all this stuff is going to be recorded. And it will certainly get to literature, more and more people will find out about it, 
But unless I can perform the miracle of immortality, it turns out none of this is science. And the reason is because once I am no longer on this mortal coil, there is no direct way for someone else to experience this miracle. And as far as science is concerned, if you cannot directly observe it yourself, it's not science. Now this very peculiar way of looking at reality gets our, many people in trouble because they don't understand that science is about what you can observe directly, not something you read in a book, not something that's taught to you in your science class, but what you can observe. That's what provides the basis of science. So Galileo's the person who basically taught us that. In fact, Einstein credits Galileo in the following way. He says that Galileo created the basis for science by drumming this notion into our heads. Before Galileo, you might have thought you could go to some ancient book of wisdom and read science. After Galileo, we know that's not the case. That's not how you create science. So science is a way of knowing the universe. But as my parable that I just told you shows, science actually has limits built into it because of how it is structured in dealing with data. It's a direct verification that makes for science. There's another part of science that's very important that comes to us again from Galileo. And Galileo basically said that one can become a scientist because there is what he called a book of great wisdom that lays before any of us to read. But the price for entering to reading this book is mathematics. Now most people think mathematics is this horrible thing that's done to them in school. <laughs> they do not experience mathematics as this wonderful key to understanding the universe. But for people like me, and I am a theoretical physicist, I kind of know what, people, what this statement was, made, was, was meaning to uh, convey. So for me, mathematics is like a third eye. It's a way for me to see parts of the universe that we cannot see in any other way. Example, well, everybody's heard of an atom, right? You all know what an atom is, but how big is an atom? Now you can go on the street and ask all your friends, your family, how big is an atom? And you'd be surprised if they, first of all, would take time to seriously respond to you. But you would be surprised at the answers because almost nobody in this society knows how big an atom is, but everybody has heard of atoms. So I'll give you a little story to the next time this comes up as a topic of your cocktail conversation. <laughs> Start with a ruler, cut it into tentacle pieces, throw away nine, keep one. You go from something about that big to about something that big. Take that remaining piece, cut it into tentacle pieces, throw away nine, keep one. You get to something about as wide as my fingernail. How many times do you have to do that to get to the size of the atom? Well, if you start at my fingernail, it's only eight more times. This is shocking to people how close atoms are. Many people like to say they're billions and billions of times away from us. They're only eight powers of, uh, 10 powers of 10 from everyday life. That's where the atom lives. People like me use mathematics to know these things. In fact, you can ask the question, who's the first person to know the size of the atom? You've actually heard of this person, but you don't know he did this. His name is Albert Einstein. The same year that he created the special relativity that talks about the laws of space and time, he was the first person to tell us how big an atom was. Now the notion of an atom had been around uh, at least 100 years before he showed up, but nobody knew how big atoms were. And how did he find out how big atoms were? Well, he didn't build a fancy device to go do it, he used mathematics. And that's why, that's an example of why mathematics is a third eye, it is literally a third eye that lets us humans see parts of the universe that we cannot see in any other way. One of the other things about mathematics that's really interesting is it's, it's a language. And again, most people do not experience mathematics as a language. But mathematics is a language that has all the attributes of a language. It's a very peculiar language, however, because, for example, uh, mathematics uh, um, allows such a precision in its use that it has a telepathic aspect to it. What do I mean by that? Well, all words are telepathic. All language is telepathic, because what, what language does is convey ideas from one mind to another. So in that sense, it's a form of telepathy. However, the peculiar nature of mathematics is that it is a language whose telepathic realization is so precise 
that we have no other human language that compares with it. Example, let me say the color red. I want you in your mind's eye to think of red. I'll think of red along with you. <laughs> okay, I'm finished thinking of red. Now, question, what kind of red did you think about versus what kind of red I thought about? We all know the word red, but was it an azure red like the, we see in the night sky when the sun is setting? Was it a fire engine red? Was it a pink? Was it an orangish red? What red are you talking about? What red are you thinking about? This shows, in a very simple way, the imprecision in the use of language. Language is imprecise. But if I say the number one, we all have a common platform. There's no other human language that has this attribute of precision. Uh, Darwin said that uh, with mathematics, it seems as though one is endowed with a new sense. And that's that third eye capacity. Um, mathematics turns out also to be an element of the imagination. My wife often encounters people who find out her husband is a theoretical physicist. And uh, they know, often like to ask, well, what does he really do? She has a standard answer. We've been married 30 years now. She has a standard answer she gives to people. She says, he makes up stuff for a living. <laughs> but since it's mathematics, nobody can tell him it's wrong. <laughs> I say it slightly differently. You see, a physicist and a general scientist is someone who takes mathematics and uses it to tell stories. You know what a novelist does. They do that with language and punctuations. They use it to tell stories. A scientist is someone who uses mathematics to tell stories. And the stories about, are about how nature works. So uh, I'm going to, uh, in the remaining time, try to show you something about this element of the imagination. Because um, that's part of why I became a theoretical physicist. When I was in 11th grade, I had a teacher who was just utterly fantastic, a gentleman by the name of Freeman Coney. And uh, he opened this door for me. And he did it in a very simple way. You just take a piece of wood, you slant it, you watch something roll down it, you time it on a stopwatch, you measure the distance, and it turns out the relationship between the distance and the time that you measure. And that distance is a quadratic formula. Now before that, I had never thought of mathematics as having anything to do with the real world. I just thought it was a game that my teachers taught me to play in the class. But when I saw this, I had a moment of clarity. I said, this is the closest thing to magic I have ever seen. And to this day, this is the only thing in my life I've seen that has the attribute of magic. Independent of Harry Potter, of course. <laughs> so I'm going to take you, as I said in the last few minutes on, how those of us who use mathematics uh, as an element of our imagination work. So I'm hoping that we can get a transparency up, a PDF. This is something you've seen. Well, actually, you haven't seen this. But you've almost seen this. You see, this is Mendeleev's table of elements when it was first invented by Mendeleev. You will notice that it has holes. Well, Mendeleev used those holes to predict the elements that should go there. And this is what the modern table looks like, completely symmetrical. Now, it turns out that symmetry is actually a part of mathematics. And so the, the fact that it didn't look like it was mathematics, because it was just a chart. You see, mathematics is much more rich than the things that you write down on papers in your classroom. Mathematics is as, as elastic as music, as elastic as language. Just like you have great poems or great compositions by Mozart or Rimsky-Korsakov or Tchaikovsky. Mathematics has all of those attributes. And since mathematics is at the root of science, it means science inherits those attributes also. This is what the world looks like right now to, according to the best science that we know. The things that are called bosons, you see there's a little uh, box there. The things in the upper right-hand corner called bosons are particles of, that carry forces from one place to another in the world of the submicroscopic atom. The things that you see called matter are quarks and leptons. The leptons, the most familiar is electrons. And so if you look at this table, this is what every scientist who's ever done an experiment tells you our universe looks like at the level of the very small. Does that look symmetrical to you? How about this? Does that look symmetrical? 
I sure hope you say yes. <laughs> because you see, that simple transition that I just showed you is actually a transition among equations. And in fact, the equations that are here are something called supersymmetry. If the universe has this structure, then a sort of equations that people like me have been studying for about 30 to 40, 35 to 40 years will be an accurate description of something in nature. When I was a very young physicist, it was my goal to find a magical piece of mathematics that was nevertheless an accurate description of something in nature. And we may well have done this in my 63rd year of life now, because we have found attributes of these equations that no one expected to be there. This is what it looks like when it's normal math. Don't run screaming from the room. I know, there are plus signs and minus signs and a bunch of Greek symbols. Who knows what this stuff means? But in fact, when I was um, about eight years old, I encountered one equation like this. And for me, it was like finding a beautiful shell on the beach. It's something called Schrodinger's equation, which is the basis of quantum mechanics. And I remember finding it in an Encyclopedia Britannica and kind of being stunned that there was something that looked like it was arithmetic, because it had a bunch of plus and equal signs in it, right? So it looks like arithmetic, but it was not like anything I had ever encountered in my up to then fourth grade life. So I knew there was just this funny thing and it had a strange resonance. Some 20 years later, I was in college and I saw this thing, the Schrodinger equation. This is what it looks like in terms of mathematics. However, if we can get our movie up, it turns out you can turn things like that into things like this. These are images that I and my collaborators have been developing for the, about the last 10 years, which allow us to do algebra. So as you see the balls moving, if any of you are math teachers out there, I'm doing matrix multiplication. That's matrix multiplication. When you understand how to render the mathematics as a graphical representation that fully captures all the information. Uh, in the, now, I'm doing integrals. Wouldn't it be great if you're a calculus teacher to give your kids a bunch of beads and say, play with this and I'll give you an A in your calculus class? But literally, I'm doing calculus when I do that. You'll notice there are two identical subcells. Well, those were not obvious at the beginning. However, we're going to play with this a little bit. That tingling you see there is a bunch of plus and minus signs going in the equations. We're going to do a, some flipping action here. And now we're going to crush these two subcells together so that black balls match to black, white to white, blue links to blue ink, dash to blue to dash blue, green to green, solid green, uh, dash to red to dash red, perfect matching, and open it back up. And now I can tell you I know how to take this picture and convert it back to the mathematical equations I just showed you at the beginning of this presentation. It turns out that math is an incredibly rich structure. It's part of the human imagination, and you can connect it to music. In fact, music is very mathematical. We know that there's a correlation between people who do music well and do mathematics well. Einstein was once asked, if you were not a scientist, what would you be in life? His answer was violinist. My answer would have been lawyer. <laughs> and so science inherits these attributes from the mathematics that it rests upon. Science says that you, every generation of new scientists that comes into the world is permitted to challenge the entire canon of science established up to that point. It is unlike other belief systems where, in fact, you are not encouraged to challenge the belief system that you have just learned about. In science, that's why we do experiments all the time, because the science experiments are the challenging of the beliefs that people told you were an accurate description of nature. So even though science is limited, because remember, I told you the miracle story, science can never see that story, never see that happen if it were to happen. Science can't see it, it's invisible because of the structure of science. So there are things that science cannot see. On the other hand, science leads to the technology and the engineering that allows you to walk around with a personal Wi-Fi device attached to your body and call all your friends, download the latest apps. All of that comes from science. And so I tell people that as human beings, as we try to experience this place that we call our existence, Science is part of what we need.
But I think there's a much deeper yearning in most human souls for more than science can provide. So we have to keep it into perspective. Let me close with my greatest, what I think of as the greatest story of science. 13.8 billion years ago, apparently, from all of our scientific observation, this universe came into existence in an event called the Big Bang. You've all heard of it. If you could see in microwave the kind of radiation that you have in your microwave other than the heat stuff, if you could actually see that kind of light, when you looked at the night sky, you would see that there's an echo of the Big Bang. It's called the cosmic microwave background. Our species have been seeing it since about 1964. This cosmic microwave background is a fossil. It's the reason why we scientists say, yes, there was a Big Bang, and we say it with certainty, with scientific certainty. Scientific certainty is not the same as certainty in the usual words because, you see, we always also know that there's a room for an error bar. That's part of science, too, recognizing the limitation of science. In this 13.8 billion years, about 300,000 afterwards, the microwave background actually first appeared in the sky. But in the 13.8 billion years afterwards, the universe has created exactly one copy of you how precious does that make each and every one of us? And why do we not recognize that? Thank you.